read just a few verses from the Gospel of John today and tell a little bit of the backstory of it as a challenge and encouragement for all of us. So if you follow along with me, you'll see it here on the wall as usual and also in your program. It says, when they had finished eating, that's Jesus and his disciples, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, I pray that these words that um, Peter was able to exchange with Jesus, that we too would hear your word so clearly spoken in the coming and the person and the work of Jesus. Lord, how you speak into all of our lives. It's a word we need. Lord, we know that words sustain life. We can remember words said to us in our childhood that still affect us today. And we know, Lord, we were created with a word, your word. And so I pray, Lord, even as we begin this study together, you'll speak life to us and you will make us speakers of life as well. And we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. It's one of the most uh, emotional experiences the whole summer for me. I explained how one of the things I had the privilege of doing was being invited to the U.S. Army War College in Pennsylvania. And a part of that time was one day for six hours, one of the historians from the college took us to the battlefield in Gettysburg. Now, if you've never been there before, um, I would encourage you to visit uh, there in Gettysburg, Maryland, not far from the War College. And, and part of this was six hours of literally walking the battlefield and learning what happened. Okay, and I'm not a historian that much of, of war or anything like that, but it was a powerful experience because here was a nation divided against itself, brother fighting brother. On one of those days in 1863, July 3rd, there were more casualties than any other day in American history. There were more soldiers that fell on D-Day, Pearl Harbor, any other moments of war, 9-11, there was a day during that war when more American casualties took place. I mean, it was an overwhelming sort of scene as we were led around on that battlefield. It was July 3rd, 1863, and the Union troops had the high ground, and the Confederate troops had been sort of pushing them back to this high ground all day on July 2nd. And it just so happened that the two generals of the Confederate troops discussed, well, what do we do from here? How do we go about what we need to do? And those two generals, Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet, disagreed on what they should do. In previous campaigns, they'd used different tactics that had been successful, and that day they they discussed, or actually I should say, they disagreed over what they should do. Lee said, oh, let's take a charge through the middle of the Union line because on the ends they have more troops and in the middle they're the thinnest and we can break through. And Longstreet said, look, if you do this, our guys will be out in the open and it will be a massacre. And as I said, they didn't really discuss this, they disagreed, and as a result of the disagreement, the truth is that it was never fully worked out. And because Lee was the commanding officer, he won the day. The troops were his to command. And when it became time to actually commit the troops, Longstreet was so upset that they would take this action, he couldn't even give the verbal command for his troops to go forward. He could only nod his head, 
12,500 men on the, on the Confederate side charged into the Union line. It was this incredible uh, charge called Pickett's Charge now. And here's the, sh and by the way, there were over 50% casualties that day. That's how many people died and were injured and taken prisoner. And here was the sad details. We stood in the place where that charge had gone from. Both of those two generals, Lee and Longstreet, sat on a horseback during that whole campaign just a few feet from each other as depicted here. And they never spoke even one word to each other. There wasn't a word spoken as all those men were dying. As I stood there and the historian explained in such detail, and I tried to imagine the carnage, I couldn't help but weep and think, come on, speak up, say something, work it through, talk it out, come to a solution. There's got to be a way to accomplish an understanding in the middle of all of this. And the reality was this, that, that there was a loss of life, yes, and it was a failure of strategy and tactics, but it was something so much more basic than that. It was a failure to communicate, to really come to an understanding, to really listen to each other, to hear each other out. And the reality is communication is the key to life yes absolutely study your craft learn your business do those learn those things that you need to learn but when it comes down to it in its most basic form human life is about communication and that's why I begin with this story not to make you a civil war buff or even interest you in American history but it's about human nature to see how critical our communication is the danger of not speaking up, not listening to that other person, not working through a disagreement. You see, this is the stuff of life. It's where nations rise and fall. You know, that was the turning place, the turning point of history, of that point of history in this country. It's also where marriages begin and where they become broken. It's where friendships are won and where they're lost. It's where children thrive and where they wilt like dying flowers. It's where businesses fail and flourish. It is there with communication. The writer of the book of James, James tells us this, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. In other words, he says this, look, if you get this part of your life right, you'll be as close to perfect as a human being can get. In other words, this is this significant in your life, the ability to be able to speak, to communicate, and to listen well. Yes, it seems basic. But this is the stuff of life, and this is the purpose of this study we've entitled, We Need to Talk. Now, usually when you hear those words, you're like, Ugh, okay, this is going to be a serious conversation. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to hear what comes next. <laughs> this is going to be very serious. There's a problem we need to work out. But this is simply a call to talk. We need to communicate. Because we've really stopped talking with each other. You know, that's what the studies say. Gone are the days when, when a family would have dinner together and they would just linger at the table and share their lives with each other. That doesn't happen anymore. Gone are the days when actually that person you call returns your phone call and communication takes place, right? We live in this age of unreturned phone calls and text messages rather than personal conversations, and the results are not good. We have stopped talking at the expense of our relationships. I don't know, a few years back, I was reading this really cool story about this couple, Liz Barry and Bill Wetzel. They, when they met in college, they got really interested in communication, and so they did something really cool. They went into New York City, and for the course of about a year, they would sit out two lawn, chair, lawn chairs just on a sidewalk with a sign that just says, talk to me. Now, when people saw that, they're like, okay, they want donations, or this is some kind of gimmick, but there was nothing like that. They weren't looking for money. Literally, they were just saying, we're willing to talk. We will listen 
if you will talk to us. And when people got past the, the thought that it was a gimmick, the magic began to happen. And it was amazing. You know, imagine an, an undercover police officer walking by and he explains how he and his girlfriend broke up six months ago and, and how he had just found out she's not only dating someone else, but they're engaged to be married. He's like, how, how did this happen? Or the woman who comes up and talks about her overbearing mother and how she struggled with this so much of her life. What is she going to do? Or the man who walks up who last week, his wife passed away. And they were married over 30 years, and people were opening up their lives and sharing their lives together. It was a beautiful thing that was happening, and that's why we plan this time of learning and sharing our lives in community. And that's how I want to introduce this series. I want to talk about talking, how we need to recover and return to face-to-face -face communication. So we'll learn a lot of practical things, hopefully, as we go through to be better communicators. But also, and more importantly, we'll learn how does the gospel apply to communication? What does it mean for Christ to come into our lives? How does that affect, or should it, how will it affect our communication? So today you could say, I want to make a case for communicating. And I'm not talking about cell phones, text messages, or Snapchat. I'm talking about really talking, the old-fashioned way, face-to-face, -face, right? Now, this passage that I read is a very pivotal passage in the life, not just of one disciple, but the movement of the disciples after this. It tells about a conversation that happened after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And to understand it, we need to know what happened before this, before the resurrection of Jesus, the two characters, of course, are Jesus and, and Peter having this conversation. And the amazing thing about Peter was he was the bold one. He was the apostle out front. He was the leader among them. He was the loudest. He would be the first to speak up. And often he was. The, he was the first to confess Jesus. And as Jesus is heading to the cross in Jerusalem, Peter is boasting he says, Jesus, I, I, I can see this could be a bad thing, but let me tell you, I don't care where you go and what happens to you, I will stick with you. Everybody else may fall away, they may walk away from you, but I won't. I will be with you to the end. When the time came, this is what happened. When Jesus was arrested, Peter followed along to, follow, to see what was happening. And as he did, three times he was asked if he was a disciple of Jesus, if he knew this man, and if he was a part of the movement. And each time, Peter said no. And not only that, the third time he was so angry that he was asked, he swore down a curse on himself. Like, God so help me, I don't know this guy, he said. And then it became very clear that he had denied Jesus. When he realized he'd done that, the gospel writers say he simply wept. He wept bitterly. Now we know Jesus died for Peter, for his forgiveness, right? But now if we fast forward the tape, here's this encounter when Jesus and Peter meet. And that's where our passage picks up. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now here's what gets me about this meal. When they, they're out fishing and they come in and Jesus has prepared breakfast for them, and guess what happens? They sit down and eat together, and we are never told that Peter brings it up. Now, can you imagine the tension of that? You betrayed, I mean, you've denied Jesus three times. You've told him you would always stand with him. And when the moment came, you failed and you denied him. And you sit through a whole meal together, sort of looking at Jesus, wondering, you know. You ever been in a situation like that where the tension of being together is overwhelming? Imagine that this is what has happened. How difficult is that to be sitting with Jesus though you've done this to him? There is no record Peter spoke a word. And I thought, how often is that the truth for us? We remain silent. We know that there's a rift, but oh, we don't bring it up. We don't actually talk about it. 
The needed conversation never takes place. The con- confession of love is never made. The words of gratitude are never spoken. And the issue separating you is never mentioned. I love the way the book of Proverbs puts it. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now, folks, I don't want rebuke, and I wonder why would the writer of Proverbs tell us this? And the reason is because at least the person rebuking is talking. The hidden love is hidden. You know, gratitude means nothing if it's not spoken. Love until it comes out in the open, what is it? And that's what was happening with Peter. And I think we need to understand why we need to talk. Think of what is never shared, what never comes out in the open, because you never bring it up. You never talk about it. And they're sitting with Jesus. Peter might have brought this up. He might have asked for forgiveness from Jesus. But he doesn't. Last week I shared a little bit of the story of my mom's life and how it wasn't until later in life she learned some of her own story. And there was a really telling event that happened years ago after her mother died in which I remember so much, this conversation that was missed. By this point, both of her parents had passed away. Here's a picture of our family, me and my two grandparents, my mom and, and my two brothers. And, uh, but this, by this point in time, my mom's dad and mom had passed away, and I was with my mom, and we were in one of those big storage bins, you know, where you put your stuff and you don't have room for it, because my grandmother for the last, I think, month of her life was in a, f- a facility where she could get care, but could, she couldn't have her stuff. And so I was there with my mom. Her mom had just died like a week before, and we're sorting through all of her mom's stuff, and her mom tells, my mom tells me, you know what, I, I, it was always hard being an only child. It was hard being the only child in the home. Yeah, I got a, a lot of attention. She told me she always wanted a sibling, and then this is what she said to me, I never asked my parents why they didn't have more children. Now, you can imagine what I'm thinking as she says this to me. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, why did you never bring this up to your parents? She said, well, I never knew maybe my mom couldn't have children, or maybe I was such a difficult child they didn't want any more children. But she never asked the question, and I stood there looking at her thinking, this is a question she can never ask them. It's too late. The conversation will never take place. And as I thought about it, I thought, what are the conversation we need to have? The question you've never asked. The sadness, by the way, here wasn't that my mom didn't have that information, but she couldn't connect relationally with her own parents. As with Jesus, what is it you've never asked? The conversation you haven't had. It's about a relationship, isn't it? And so, you know what happens here? Jesus won't let that happen. And so he has with Peter what is undoubtedly the most intimate conversation with any person that's recorded anywhere in Scripture. This is why we need to talk. You see, because if we don't talk, we can't get close. We can't love and be loved. Sherry Turkle teaches social science at MIT, and she recently published a book with the title reclaiming conversation the power of talk in a digital age and what she's discovered along with other social scientists is how disconnected we've actually become from each other it's hard to believe right because we have all these new connection devices but we are raising a generation that doesn't know how to connect she was contacted by a middle school in new york by educators because they couldn't believe what they were seeing in their students. This is what the teachers were saying. Students don't make eye contact. They don't respond to body language. They have trouble listening. I have to rephrase a question many times before a child will answer a question in class. I'm not convinced they're interested in each other. It is as though they all have signs of being on an Asperger's spectrum. And it wasn't one student. The reason the school had contacted her is these educators said, look, we're dealing with 13-year-olds, and they are lagging behind what we used to see in 8-year-olds in the ability to connect with other people, their fellow students. There was little evidence of empathy and really connecting with other people. Why? 
without spending significant time face-to-face with others, really talking, they couldn't read faces. You know, that's how we learn to read faces and understand emotion. It's by having face-to-face conversation. And if you take that all away, we no longer even understand emotion. And so they watched these young people, and they couldn't even understand what they were seeing in the faces of their teachers and their fellow students because they're not used to looking at faces. They're not used to having face-to-face conversations. And as a result, they couldn't enter into the feelings of others. You see, without face-to-face communication, we really can't get close. We can't understand other human beings. And here, here were students who could build websites, but they couldn't know the feelings of another student that they had hurt. Because they weren't talking. They weren't having face-to-face conversations. So when they'd hurt another student, they wouldn't even realize it. They didn't show remorse. And they couldn't imagine what other students might be feeling. And the teachers were observing this loss of connection. And what is the major culprit? The students don't have to talk to each other. They can text. One of the students talked about never even ever having a face-to-face fight or disagreement with his parents because they'd always had it via text messages. And the student didn't even know how to deal with their own parents face-to-face. See, Turkle discovered a, a loss of this key building block of life, actually talking with other people, learning to read their faces learning what other people are feeling, and then how to empathize, how actually to care for other people. And she said this, it turns out that conversation is the most human and humanizing thing we do. You know, you won't be able to live as a human being and to be able to connect with other human beings without taking the time to do this. So you say, why are we not talking? Oh, sure, part of it is other ways to communicate. We need to admit how hard it is. For Peter, it was probably embarrassment, right? He felt awkward. How would you feel if you'd been unfaithful to Jesus? Are you going to bring that up? But there are lots of reasons we don't. We don't know how to say it. Or it's going to be too hard. Or it's going to take too much time. Or I don't see this ending well. Or we're afraid it's going to start a conflict, and I'm terrified of that. Or I've been hurt when I've done that before, so I'm not going there again. Or I'm afraid it's going to make matters worse. Or it'll be too personal, too deep. Or I might be misunderstood. It will make me feel vulnerable, and that frightens me, and I don't feel safe. It won't make any difference. You may tell yourself, nobody listens to me anyway. (laughs) No one really cares. Why should I speak up? My perspective and my feelings, they don't matter. So we're not talking. So couples are not talking about the loneliness they feel and the sense of distance between them. Kids are not talking with their parents about the pressure they feel to be successful and perform. Friends are not talking about the the isolation and the need for community that they feel. So let's be honest at the beginning about our need to work on our communication. Yes, it's hard. Real communication requires, you know what it requires? The cooperation of another person, not you. That person has to be willing to engage and to risk. And it's very hard to find that sometimes. It takes commitment. It's fraught with danger. And yes, you can be hurt. But there is no other way to get close to anyone. Yeah, it's easier to be silent and less personal. By the way, it is easier to send an email or a text message than to pick up the phone. You don't know what that other person is going to say. But that's why we're called to communicate in this way. I don't know, years ago I read the story of Eric Wanemeyer. You may have heard of him. On May 25th, 2001, he climbed Mount Everest. may not sound like a big deal, but about 90% of climbers do not make it to the top. Add to that that since 1953, over 165 climbers have died trying. But add to that this greater thing about it. He's been blind since he was 13 years old. How are you going to climb that mountain when you're blind? Here's Eric from the top. 
the only way. He had to be talking the whole way, didn't he? He had to be asking for directions. He had to be listening to every sound. He had to be taking every kind of direction as he was going up. The climber in front of him was wearing a bell. But every step of the way, he's like, where do I put my foot? <laughs> is my hand in the right place? How is this going to work? And as I read about this, I think that's the story of our lives, right? That if we are not communicating, if we're not willing to ask questions, if we don't realize that we need clarification, how is it going to happen? And for him, it was the matter of, a matter of life and death. And it is for all of us. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. You know, for Peter, this conversation was the difference between living in guilt and knowing forgiveness. It was the difference between being sidetracked to becoming a fisherman to becoming a fisher of men. It was the difference between wallowing in failure and standing tall to serve. And Jesus has done this because he loves him. The book of Proverbs also says this, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. The power of those words is life-changing. It's life-giving. Or it can also produce death. So let's admit how much we learn, need to learn how to communicate. How much we need to learn to trust God to go where we may be hurt. How much we need the love of Jesus to risk being understood. You say, okay, well, how am I going to do this? Where are the resources? How can I find the resources for st to start talking? Well, skills will help. And we're going to spend a, some time in this series learning some skills together. But I need to give a warning. It goes deeper than that. It goes deeper Jesus said, the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. We can't change our own hearts. I can't even really sort of get at that, right? And yet so much of our communications, co communication comes from so deep in us. It's deeper than skills can help us with. And you say, well, how do you know that? Why well, I give you a little exercise to try with me this week? Would you try this? Just for one week, okay? I'm not asking for a lifetime, just a week. For a week, would you not complain about anything? For a week, would you not boast about anything? Just this week, don't run somebody down even just a little bit with what you say or talk badly about another person. Also, don't defend or excuse yourself. Right, if a situation comes up like that, don't repeat a matter of gossip. And, by the, and also, don't give advice to anyone unless they ask you for it. Okay? Now, just sort of watch yourself for a few days and listen to the things that you say. Okay? Just sort of chart your own course. And you will know that you need more than a few pointers of being a better communicator. So where are we going to get help with that? <laughs> How's that going to happen? And the reality is it comes from the gospel, outside of ourselves. How are you going to be patient? Patient enough when you don't want to listen. How are you going to speak words that are not hurtful of other people? You see, this is what happens between Peter and Jesus. What might have been a moment of rebuke and hurt to Peter actually is all about restoration and love. The third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, he, he, Peter appears to be hurt in this because Jesus is asking them the question about whether he loves him. But the reality of this conversation, every bit of it, was about Jesus loving him. It was Jesus' way of telling Peter, I love you and I have a place for you in my mission because every time that's what he says to him. He says, Peter, I have a place for you. Of course I know that you love me. Find my sheep, join my mission. 
You see, it is Jesus' love that can make us safe and give us a place where we can have the conversations that we need. And this is really the gospel in a nutshell. You see, Jesus came as what Scripture says, God's Word made flesh. He wouldn't remain silent with us, and so he spoke into the conversation that had broken down and fallen apart because of conflict. And what was his word? His word was Jesus. It was him saying, I love you, and I am for you, and I'm with you in the journey. I am for you in everything. And Jesus, his whole purpose is to bring us together with God. So that the conversation can continue and enabling us to talk. And this is the way Jesus spreads the love of God into our lives. And this love then empowers us to go to those conversations that haven't happened or have broken down. His love empowers us to share our lives then with each other. Uh, A few years ago, I was listening to This American Life. Maybe you listened to it with Ira Glass. Very cool, National Public Radio. And he tells the story of this young man named David Ellis Dickerson. He grew up in an evangelical home, and he went to college. And when he went to college, he began questioning everything he believed. And as a result of doing this, one day he woke up and and he thought, I was wasting my whole life when I was growing up. I was misled by my parents to believe all this stuff about God and Jesus and to be in church and to do all those things that I've done. And the result of all of this was years later when David finally went home, he was looking forward to the day when he could look his father in the eye and tell him all of his faith, all the things he believed were all empty. And so he sort of set up this scene. And it happened one night when he and his dad went out to dinner. And it was sort of ironic because he looked over as his dad, you know, they were sitting in a booth. And his dad was sort of wearing western gear. And he was too. And he was sort of like, this is going to be like a shootout. And I'm totally loaded with ammunition. And I'm going to win. I'm going to tell my dad what I really think. And I'm going to put him in his place. And, and the moment actually came. And David just let it all fly. And he had plenty of ammunition. He attacked his dad. He told him his beliefs were empty. He told him Jesus, eternal life, the Bible. None of it meant anything. And this is what David said. He said, he quietly let me do my own thing. And then he said, I'm really proud of everything you've done. Wow. Here was this moment. When he wanted his dad to fight with him. And the only thing that his father had to speak to him were words of love. He didn't feel condemned or controlled or manipulated. He felt free and beyond all of his anger and his doubts, he could see in his father that living faith that he really had had come to try and deny. He'd seen it because his father could only speak words of love to him. And as I heard that story, I thought, isn't that the gospel that into the middle of our lives, into all the brokenness, when Jesus has a chance to speak or when the Father comes to you, he's only like, I love you so much. You have no idea how how, how much I am for you and that I came for you. And this is what Jesus not only does to Peter, but God does with us when we come to him. We're expecting him to rub our face in our failure, and he lifts up our head and he tells us that he loves us, and he has a plan for our lives, and he cares for us. And what I think about is this, is that we won't be capable of consistent loving speech until we hear that word from God. Until we receive and live in his grace. There will always be an angle or a tone or a strategy to satisfy my needs, the needs of my broken heart. And so that's what this journey is all about. Being able to hear the word of God spoken to you. Because by the way, he's the one who spoke us into existence with his word. So that we will be able to speak to each other. And today I just want to ask you to do... Three simple things. First, to put this into practice. First, admit your need for connection. Admit how disconnected you feel. You see, God made us for connection. And I think our culture with all our connective devices has left us feeling isolated and alone. And then second, purposefully say before God in prayer, I want to open up my life 
to relationship. Now, you can do that in a community group. I hope you do. I hope you become a part of a group. Or you can do that by asking somebody where you work, just out for coffee or a family over for dinner. I feel in many ways I'm like that blind man trying to climb Everest, and it isn't going to happen unless there's a lot of communication in my life. And finally, make it personal. Would you, during these eight weeks, opt for the most personal communication you can do? That means if you're getting ready to send that email, and it's, it really is about just calling that person three cubicles over, that you pick up the phone and you call them so you can hear their voice. Or if you've got an opportunity to walk over to their office, instead of sending a text message, you go over so you can see their face. Because when you see their face, you're going to be able to tell how they're doing. You're going to be really entering their world and their life. So would you look at those conversations or those communications and say, could I just make it more personal? What would it be like if I just took a a more personal step? It may take a little longer, but thank that person you need to thank. Tell that person you love that you love them. And let's talk. Father, thank you when those first two people turn away from you and your word tells us they went into hiding, you could have just allowed there to be silence. You could have turned away from them and the story would be so different. But Father, even then, you pursued them to get them talking because you love them. You love us. And Father, I thank you that that's what you do in our lives. That even today to worship, to be here, is to recognize that you're the God who comes to us. You send your word, your living word in Jesus. The word made flesh so that we would be able to hear your voice. We would be able to know your love. We'd be able to have a relationship. We'd be able to be a people, your people, and you to be our God. And Lord, I pray that you'd teach us this way. You know how much we struggle in being able to communicate, being able to listen, and being able to share our hearts with other people in productive ways. Even the people, especially the people closest to us. And so we cry out for your your help. And Father, even as we begin, I pray that you'll remind us, as Jesus reminded Peter by that conversation, how much we're loved by you. And that would create a space, a way for us to talk, for us to share our lives. And Father, we thank you, and we pray together in Jesus' name, amen.